Isn't it amazingly cold today? <laughs> Holy cow. Hi, Dave. Was it, I mean, it, it was hot. Did you guys, did you guys stay cool? Did you guys stay inside? How do you guys cope with it? No? You worked outside. Yeah, there were days. I used to, I used to work. Do, do we have any golfers in here? Does anybody golf? Don, do you golf? Just once in a while. When I, I used to actually work uh, for, gosh, I, I, when I was in college, it's one of the things I did. Actually, even one of my first jobs when I was 14, 15 was I worked on a dairy farm. So I was always outside and you'd be milking cows at like five in the morning and three in the afternoon and bailing hay. And then not only bailing it out in the field, then you had to stack it in that sweltering barn like up high. And, and uh, so I'm used to being out in the heat. But when you're away from it for a long time and now you're just kind of hanging out in the office in the air conditioning, man, it is sweltering. I get in the car and it's reading like 100 degrees. I was like, whoa, that's warm today. But uh, I hope you guys are doing good. Do you, it's the second week of this school already. Isn't that amazing? The time, the time is just flying by, guys. It really is. And, and today being Wednesday, tomorrow, Thursday, the second week's going to be at an end. And we, we had so much, I don't even know if you would even call it fun. I don't know what it was this morning. I don't know if there was a dry eye in the room by the time we were done this morning. And uh, I, there were mo the couple times throughout the session that I was crying because I'm, I'm going to be honest with you guys. There are things, there are things well, how, let me just say this. How many of you know that what you understand about God today is not what you understood about him a year ago? Isn't that awesome? And in his grace and in his kindness, he's always working with us to the degree that we believe in the moment, right? So when I was 19 years old at the cost of a drug-addicted life and when God stepped in my life, literally, and, and I was standing up front and I was, I was recounting the story, and as I was recounting the story of what was going on in my heart and in my life, just the tears started to fall again because I've spent time Guys, getting rooted and grounded in the reality that when I was 19, just as if it was 2,000 years ago, Don's coming up to save me right now. Yeah, I would love to trade. All right. Now I'm, now I'm freed up. Now I'm not bound anymore. So, but here's, here's, here's the deal, guys. Yeah, it's the gospel. It's awesome. Even when I was driving in here, you know what song was just in my heart as I was driving here? Do you guys know that song? Uh, uh, it's by Bruno Mars. It goes, because you're amazing. I'm not a singer. Because you're amazing just the way you are. That's true about you right now. Isn't, that, isn't it amazing that if in the beginning was the word, and the Word was God and was with God. And if that's who He was in the beginning, and He came to reveal who He was through His Son and put heart, the flesh on His heart, that that was even how He saw you in the beginning. The Bible says in John 15, He tells the disciples, depending how you read it, you can interpret it this way, that they were with Him in the beginning of His ministry. But He tells them that they're going to go out and testify because you've been with me from the beginning. I think He, he always knew. I think you always were with Him before the foundation of the world. This will trip you out. Do you know it says in Hebrews 4 that before the foundation of the world, he rested from all of his works? What do you do with that? Amen. And then it says in Ephesians 1 that before the foundation of the world, you were to be found in him, in Christ, holy and blameless. That you were in Ephesians 2, his workmanship created for good works in Christ beforehand. So all this stuff was finished Right? So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God and was with God. In the beginning, guys, hear me, was it is finished. In the beginning. That's what Satan came and challenged in the garden. Are you sure? See, because if we're not convinced of that, if we're not convinced that, that Christ, when he, was, when he was crucified and said it is finished, if we're not convinced of that, we're still trying to finish it, guys. Either he is for you or he's not. Either he loves you or he doesn't. Either you're accepted or you're not. Either you're forgiven or you're not. Right? Either you're healed or you're not. See, there's a lot of things that I believe the cross has shouted that I've accepted and said it is finished. And then there are other things where, to, truthfully, I do still struggle with. And one of them is, like, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I mean, the, there are times where my body still experiences aches. There are times I still get sick. Right? But how many of you know it's possible to, have, to not even have that stuff ever touch you? I heard Smith Wigglesworth once say, if we put as much faith in doctors, as, as, if we put as much faith in God as we do in doctors, I wonder how different things would be. 
But in my going to the doctor, to a degree, I'm still trying to finish what's already been finished. That doesn't mean we're disqualified. That doesn't mean poor you, you're a wretch, get your act together. It's not that. It just means, God, can I tell you truthfully, we are constantly throughout this walk with God learning to trust him more every day. That's what the whole thing is about, guys. Because honestly, and like I've said, and I'm going to spend some more time tonight really just kind of unpacking how we see God, because honestly, and it's the bulk of, of, of my counseling that I do with people, and it was cool when Don yesterday was talking about he saw a lot of restorations happen in this past week. Some of the phone calls that I get are people that are in situations and circumstances, and they're blaming people for how they've turned out. And they're saying, if it didn't go this way, then I wouldn't be like this. And do you know what they're really saying? They're not even necessarily blaming somebody for how they turned out. What they're saying is, I don't like me. I don't like how I turned out. And that's the core issue, right? So for me, it's like, I, I don't, for the longest time, and I want to show you, I, I, God, God really, he, he really, he really, I got to see some really cool revelation this, these last few days I want to um, really share with you because I'm, I'm not afraid, guys, to ask, because I said, we're not, what we understand about God now is not what we understood a year ago. Hallelujah, that's amazing, right? And uh, so we're constantly growing, and to the degree that we trust him is, is the more we'll submit, the more we'll yield, the more we're able to be fathered by him, the more we're able to be pottered by him. But there are things, guys, that people have come to believe about God through life that they cling to white-knuckled, and Jesus said, the thing that you're holding on to, the thing that you're wishing to save is what's killing you. But that which you let go of, you find, right? Yep. So there's a, lot of th- there's a lot of people, and this was the issue on the planet. So watch this. In the beginning was the Word. The Word, according to Hebrews 4.12, is able to do what? It's like a sword that's able to divide between soul and spirit. So he's talking about it's going to the innermost recesses of a man. Able to reveal, to judge the intentions and the thoughts of a man's heart. Right? So Jesus, when he came to the earth, said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. What was he doing? If the word is is revealing the contents and the hearts and the intentions and the thoughts of a man, what was he doing on the earth? He was exposing what we've come to believe, right? And and here's the deal, guys. And and it's like in certain arenas, in certain circles, and I'm sure Don knows what I'm talking about, there are some questions in church you were just not allowed to ask, and if you weren't on board with it, you'd be considered like a blasphemer and a heretic. Do you know what I mean? I'd rather be a heretic than a hypocrite. I'd rather believe wrong, but, but honored my conscience in what I claimed I believe, rather than saying one thing with my mouth and living a completely different thing. Do you know what I'm saying? So there's, there's, a, there's, there's things that, truthfully, guys, if, we're, if, if there are things that we're believing about God that are not producing life and they do not sound like the good news, I think we should throw it out. And there are things that I, I have no problem. There are things that, truthfully, that I've accumulated over the years, things that I've believed, and I said last week that one of the strategies of the enemy is to get us to develop theologies, doctrines, apart from what Jesus came and revealed. That's what's killing people today. Right? Because the evidence, and here's a good barometer of where people stand and what they believe about God is their alone time with him. Honestly, if you are super pumped in the morning, if you are super pumped to get alone and commune with this God, more than likely you're seeing him clearly. If you're not, more than likely there's something off in how you're seeing him and what you're believing about him. Right? The only thing, hey guys, listen to, with all my heart, how many of you guys know and understand that the role of the Holy Spirit on the earth right now in the believer, there's a few, but in John 14, 15, 16, Jesus is really emphasizing that he's going to bring to remembrance all that he said and lead you and guide you into all the truth. I really believe, everybody in this room, that you're so on board with me that I really want to know the truth. And if it's not Jesus, I want to throw it away. And God help me if I'm believing things that aren't true about you. God, believe, God help me if there's things I'm believing about you that life has taught me that have nothing to do with you. The things we talked about today, I'm telling you, I, I don't know if there was a dry eye in the room because people, literally, God was just, and I don't know if it had to do with your prayer yesterday, Don, or not, with you laying hands on, and there were people that, did Don do that in here yesterday with you guys at night? Man, I had people come up and testify, Don, they felt like they were floating in the air. And I think in, God's, in, in Don's faith and in his prayer, I think God opened up the capacity for people to receive more of what God has for them today, this morning. And Adam, it was so funny, Adam, when he, when he came up and he introduced me and he prayed and he said, Let, what Brian says today cause us to even retreat into the, our prayer closet all the more. 
And as we were, I mean, it was as if, I, I believe this with all my heart, every time you guys are coming in here, like, and I can't think of a better way to spend your time and money, it's as if the chisel and the hammer's in his hands, and he's just constantly, guys, constantly refining, constantly chipping away. That has nothing to do with him, right? So this is, for me, um, it, was, it was so funny. I had, a, I had a woman come up to me and say, I had to watch what you said last week four times in a row. And she said, by the time I was done, I felt like I was starting over at ground zero. I felt like everything that I believed was a lie. And I said, honey, I said, that's totally okay. That's, that's a good thing. We want to know him, you know, but like, because here's the deal. A lot of us, our faith is like bricks. And if you remove one of them, the whole thing comes tumbling down and people will guard those bricks with, with white knuckles and everything that they have. That was the issue people had with Jesus, Right? They couldn't handle what he was revealing about what they believed. And all the, all the while, God is constantly, and I'll show you guys, in, uh, in, in, it was amazing the revelation God deposited in my heart. He was showing me, he took me to the book of Exodus in chapters 15, 16, and 17, the places that they visited. Every one of those names has extreme prophetic symbolism, and, and it's just awesome. And it was all the while he is purging them of what they had come to believe about themselves and about him in Egypt, right? Because watch. God said to me, I think it was yesterday morning, he said, what was fathering Israel for 400 years? I said, it was bondage and slavery, Lord. Their view of God, all that they knew of him, unless it was stories passed down and what Joseph was doing, what he was up to in Egypt, their view of God and their understanding of God would have been Pharaoh because Pharaoh made himself out to be God. What's Pharaoh? He's a taskmaster. So what? That he brings them out to find out who he is, to taste and see that he's good, and all the while, they can't because of what was fathering them for 400 years. He's trying to get them to unlearn what they've learned for 400 years. But could you imagine the warfare that must have taken place in their mind as they're out wandering around and them saying things like this, are you kidding me? 400 years and now you want me to trust you? Where were you? Why'd you wait this long? What's been, what's been the holdup? You know what was amazing to me? This Because I, I asked God, I said, God, 400 years, what's up with that? They were crying out, right? This is what he said to me. He said, Brian, in Galatians 4 was at the fullness of the time that I came. When men were at their worst, there was no more of a wicked generation than when Jesus came, right? Because where sin was abounding, grace abounded more, right? It was at the fullness of the time when Egypt was at its worst because what was going on in Egypt when Moses showed up? What was, happen what was happening when Moses was being born? They were killing children. What was happening in Jesus' day? They were killing children. Where sin was abounding, grace abounded more when God raised up a deliverer through Moses. And I told, it, it was so awesome. I was talking this morning. God was giving me revelation as I was talking. This is the good news. No matter what, in your darkest hour, get ready for grace to abound more. At the fullness of the time, at the fullness of the time in my own life, God showed up. When I was literally at the end, when I came to an end in and of myself, at 19, and I told the group it was awesome. Like, and, and, it's not, and we're not comparing war stories. Every single one of us has one. It's all relative depending on the person, right? And I told the group this morning, I said, here's the deal, guys, from the bottom of my heart. And I'm not looking to magnify Satan. I'm not looking to bring him glory. But I'd rather you understand how he works and how he operates so you can, we can expose him and so we can just move on, right? And, and start to understand God's voice more than, th more than his. But there is a way that seems right to a man, and it fathered us most of our entire lives, and a lot of that we've taken because it made sense to us and we said God is like that. And the issue, the issue, guys, is not so much, and this is, this is what I wanted to say earlier. I'm not afraid to topple the apple cart over and pick up each individual apple and see if it belongs back in the cart. Because I'm, I'm telling you, and, and one of the things for me, and it's just me, and like, I'm telling you, people would drive me out of places. And there, there are books that were written today, guys, and like in years past, and they're so controversial and we make judgments about these books that are written and a lot of, we're hearing secondhand information about them. We're not reading them ourselves, right? And, and we're cutting people off and thinking that's heresy and everything else. No, a lot of people, like, if your desire, because I, I think we have, and I've heard, I, I don't know if it was Dan said or Todd said, it seems like we have more faith in our ability to be deceived than in God's ability to keep us and protect us. So we're so afraid of being deceived, so afraid of false doctrine, so afraid of, of false teaching creeping in. And, and one of the things that really brought people, I'll be honest with you, the things that brought people to tears today, and it was, oh gosh, it was so beautiful, was I, I read from the book The Shack this morning. God laid it on my heart. 
He laid it on my heart to look at that chapter that's called Here Comes the Judge. I don't know if you've ever read that book. Holy moly. And one of the things that God's really speaking to my heart about, guys, because it's, 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 it's an issue that I think a lot of people have. They have a hard time reconciling grace, mercy, and forgiveness and the judgment of God in the way that we understand it. That he's assigning people to places and making it more about a place than a condition here and now. And one of the things I, I, I talked about with people, I'm like, guys, come on. Like, if, if we have that much mercy, if we have that much freedom, and if it was for freedom's sake that Christ came to get us free, and even if the enemy had freedom to fall in heaven, what if they're, and again, like, hear me, like, I'm, my mind's not made up about this, but we're afraid to talk about it because we're, we think, like, we're, we're deceiving people and stuff like this. But here's, for me, you guys heard me talk about this last week with the prodigal son story. Heaven and hell is both at the party right then and there. Heaven and hell literally is at the same party at the same time, and it's the mindset and the perspective of the brothers. He just got done talking about it, and the audience is the Pharisees because the Pharisees were the ones that had it. I, I really believe, I, I'm very concerned for those that claim that they know all that there is to know about him, and they're refusing to bend, and what they're doing is they're actually making it more difficult for people to get to God, and they're relating to the wrong God in the wrong way. And I'm afraid that when he comes for some, they're just going to be like, in the same way they couldn't recognize him when Jesus was on the earth. But literally, he just gets done saying in Luke 15, he talks about how there's so much joy in heaven when one sinner repentance changes his mind, right? Do you know that the role of the Holy Spirit, according to John 16, is to convict the world right now of three things? It's sin, righteousness, and judgment. And you know why it's sin? Because people don't believe. That's the essence, I talked about it last week, of sin, guys. You know how faith is a substance? Of th you know, the, the, uh, the assurance of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen? The substance of sin is the disbelief that God is good. That's what Satan got man to question in the garden. Are you sure he's not holding out on you? Are you sure it's really finished? Are you sure he really loves you? Come on, look at life. Where was he? How could he? Why didn't he stop? Right? And before we know it, Don talked about it yesterday. We're subpoenaing God, subpoenaing God. What, am I saying that right? We subpoena God in the court of our mind, right? And now the greatest issue isn't so, and the moment man fell, the moment man fell, man took his place as judge of God because Satan reproduced himself in man and Satan's the accuser of the brethren, the accuser of the Lord. Where is he? Where was he? Why didn't he? So now, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I was, I was sharing real life examples from my own family where I have a, I have a brother, my oldest brother, his name, is, his name is Jeff. He wouldn't mind me talking about this. It's not a big deal. He's, uh, he's 40 years old, guys. And driving in, I was, I was choked up thinking about this because I really feel like God is just really opening my heart for, for people even more that just are believing the wrong way about him. And don't you know, guys, that it's eternal life is knowing him right now. In that word eternal, see, we, we think it's always about like a, a duration of time that's forever. The Greek word, and, and I'm not a Greek scholar, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but do you guys understand that the Bible is written in Hebrew and Greek, right? Okay, so the Greek word for eternal is actually aeon or eon, right? Do you ever hear people talk about, man, that seems like eons away, or, right? So that word actually also is translated as an intense moment of time. Do you ever sit in class and say, man, I wish this class would be over with, it's taking forever, that's an intense moment of time, right? Hopefully you're not feeling that way about this one. But that's an intense moment of time. There's a, you, can, you can know God in extreme intensity right now and experience that joy and experience that righteousness and experience that kindness. But life, apart from Jesus, is lying to you. It, I'll make it that black and white. Life, apart from Christ, is a lie if it's not what he came to reveal, right? Right? Because it's robbing us. It's a false perspective. I said today, you know, do you know the Old Testament is shadows and copies of things to come? My daughter watches a show called Sid the Science Kid. I don't know if any parents in here know that show. It's on PBS in the mornings. You, who said they watched it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't understand. This kid goes to a school. I don't understand. There's only four in his class, including him. I'm like, what kind of school is this? And the whole school is, and I don't know if it's a preschool. I don't know what it is. They're little and stuff. And it's all about science and exploration and whatnot. But um, it's, it's fascinating because he says, there, there's one of the shows, and it was on recently. God's so amazing how he sets this whole thing up. Sid notices that the sun casts a shadow on the pavement, right? Because the sun is you know, over him, and, he, and he's looking at his shadow, and he notices, 
He brings his mom outside because he's always about doing experiments and exploring things and stuff like that. And he says, Mommy, look, when I smile, I can't see my shadow smile. Some are getting it, some are not. Some are finding God through the eyes of the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. And when you try to do that, you can't see his smile if you're not looking with New Covenant eyes, New Testament eyes, and Kingdom eyes. It's shadows and copies of things to come. But now there's a new and living way that's, that's been made with Christ, right? So why I brought that up, I have no idea. It was food for thought. I was driving in here. It seemed right at the moment. But listen, my oldest brother, who's 40 years old, right? Because guys, I'm convinced if it's not Jesus, we, I, have to, I have to ask if it's really God. And we have to understand that he revealed the Father. And that God is constantly throughout history working with people to the degree that they understand and the degree that they know him. Do you know, I was saying this like, this, this, this is so staggering to me. Do you know that death was reigning from Adam till Moses, but they had no knowledge of it until the law came? That's in Romans. I think it's Romans 4 talks about it, Romans 5. And men, prior to the knowledge and understanding of sin, were actually having relationship with him in such a way that Enoch was taken up with him. Holy moly, right? So we talked about this last week, that through the law, which was amazing, it was good, right? It came 430 years after the promise that was made to Abraham because you receive a promise, you don't work for the promise, right? It was coming regardless, right, concerning his seed, capital S, meaning what, who, that Jesus was gonna come through the line of it and all the nations through Abraham, the father faith would be blessed. But the law was given, because it was added because of transgressions in an effort to reveal what was killing you. It's, am it's, 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 it's amazing, guys. And, and God didn't give it for himself. He gave it for us to stir up a longing for us to come home. It's the broken and contrite heart that he wants, guys, not whole burnt offering and sacrifice. That's why it says in Hebrews 10, a body you prepared for me. Because you didn't, he's talking about the, when G the day Jesus was coming because you didn't take delight in these things, God. These things were constantly reminding people of what they weren't. They were selling themselves short all the time. Living, do you know that history records on that day when they would actually celebrate Passover and they would sacrifice the lambs, right? Do you know that every sacrificial lamb was raised in Bethlehem? Do you know that? Do you know where Jesus is from, right? Do you know that literally it's recorded that on that day, the sacrifices in Jerusalem, the blood would run ankle deep through the streets of Jerusalem? How intense is that? It says that year after year, they could actually, they, the smell of the burnt carcasses wouldn't leave the air. It was the constant reminder of their, the stink of their sin. And only, guys, we make sin so much about behavior. Please listen to me. We're only doing it because we don't trust him. We're only doing it because we're not sure he is who he says he is. And Satan has lied to us and deceived us that he's really not that good. And the whole time they're in the wilderness, God's trying to purge them of that belief. And I'll show that to you. The very first place that they come to is a place called Shore. It actually means wall. S-H-U-R translates as wall. and also translates as sour. Because there are people today that have tasted and seen the salvation of God. Did they taste and see the salvation of God? Yeah. Was the sea parted? Was there a Passover? Yeah. They tasted, the, was, there, was there a judgment on Egypt? Was there plagues that were placed on Egypt? Absolutely. Have, have people today through the cross seen the salvation of God? Are people still continuing in mindsets that are part of who they used to be, who, they, who Satan said they were? Do you know what I'm saying? Lies that they've come to believe. So they tasted and saw the salvation of God and they're wandering around in the wilderness and the first stop that they come to is a place called Shore. Actually, it's, it's like the second or third, I can't remember. And it actually translates as being sour or wall because there is a wall that was existing between them and God and it was simply this. We were fathered for 400 years in Egypt by slavery and bondage. Where were you? Why weren't you here? Why didn't you step in? How come you didn't stop? And he had to, because unless, unless that's removed, you can't enjoy the party. You can't, so watch. It, that whole thing is, is a picture and shadow of a born again experience. Do you know that John 3 says, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. You can't, it's not talking about getting to heaven one day. It's now that you'd be able to perceive and understand. Because then it says, if you're not born, if you're not born by the spirit and water, you won't enter the kingdom of God right? Because God wants you to enter his kingdom and birth you out. But we're constantly entering. We're, we're, we're. What time is it? I want to know how much time I have to really unpack this thing. Come on, God. 730. 
Guys, let's do this. Turn to Exodus right now, chapter 15. Life for a long time, guys, has been our teacher, not the Son of God. And there are things that we've come to believe about God that aren't true just because it makes sense according to how our life was and how it went and how it, you know. So I have an older brother, going back to what I was saying earlier, who's 40 years old, and his biological father left my mother at 19. He got her pregnant at a very early age. And my oldest brother, for years, I would hear him say, and I don't hear it so much on his lips anymore, but he would make comments like this, if I ever meet my father, I'll kill him. And he was serious about that. He wasn't playing around, he wasn't joking, because life taught him through that, that he wasn't lovable, that he was rejected, that he was abandoned. And if you continue the line, if you continue the logic, and if you continue the, the, the process, why, did, why didn't you stop it, God? It was the father you gave me, the father I never knew. God, it was the woman you gave me. And we step into, and that's exactly what Satan wants to do. He wants to sit on the throne of your mind, bring God into court, and begin to judge him. We said last week, guys, this is just, again, like, if it's for me, if it's not producing life, and if it's not good news, and it's not the gospel, I'm not afraid to say what's going on here, and really, really delve in and start studying some things out. Because it seems like the judgment in the day of Jesus was all about, he was, he was revealing what men believed. And the judgment was that we had to decide what we were going to believe. The script he was writing or the script we've written. The picture he painted or the picture we, we've painted through his son. Because we talked about this last week. Our perspective of God fell in the garden. I think Adam probably talked pretty heavily about that last week in Genesis 3. We talked about that a little bit where, where God said, where are you, not what did you do? And instantly they hid for the fear of him, right? So what changed? Did God change in that moment or did our understanding of who he was change? In that moment, we inherited the knowledge of good and evil apart from love, right? And so all we, all we had was the awareness that we did something wrong. And now he must be coming to, to, to come after me, kick butt, take names. And let's face it, life's taught us that, guys. We talked about that. For a long time, our parents related to us like that. To the best that they knew how, according to Hebrews 2, they were disciplining us. The discipline of the Lord is for the, tra- the sake of training up in righteousness and yielding the peaceful fruit of it. We don't have to be afraid of, of, uh, of the discipline of God. He says he scourges every son he receives. Thank God. I don't want to hold on to some of the stuff that I come to believe apart from him. I don't want anything to do with that. Because like I said before, heaven and hell is literally at the same party in the, in the story of the prodigal son. This is what's staggering to me. Do you know, guys, like this, he, a man, was being lowered on a pallet by his friends and he looks at the man and says, your sins are forgiven you. Did he die yet? What's going on? He talks to them in John 15, 3, says, you're already clean because the word I've spoken to you. Did he die yet? He says to them, I no longer call you slaves, I call you friends. Did he die yet? He's already calling them friends. Wonder if this isn't how he always saw us. Wonder if this isn't, if in the beginning really was the word. Wonder if it's always been our issue and not his issue. Wonder if we're the ones that have been veiled, not him. Think about this with me, guys. Come on, you'll get born again. This is awesome. His heart towards you is absolutely amazing. He really does. God, I saw myself walking into her, opening up my Bible, joking around, saying, hey guys, here's the deal. God loves you, closing it and just walking out. That, that's it. That's the message. The issue is we have a hard time receiving and believing that because life told you that that's not true. Life told you you can't trust and therefore I don't know. And if you follow the line, the, the line of thinking, you follow the logic, it comes back to the lie in the garden. It all does. It was the woman that you gave me. It's your fault. You're the one to blame. Otherwise, this never would have happened. I have friends that don't believe that God even exists because their parents divorced. They say, if God's real, that never would have happened. Yes, sir. What do I tell him? I tell him, man, you know what? There's so much capacity. Truthfully, at that moment when they would say those things to me, I wasn't even ready to even answer their question. I felt so ill-equipped to even answer it. If it was now, I would tell them and I would magnify. See, the the, the issue is, and and it's difficult, because sometimes people, and this came up actually in the morning service. There was somebody that, and the morning service got so intense 
that people started asking questions like, and, and it is, guys, it's hard to talk about. People started asking questions like, well, if, if God is that way, then why is he allowing two, two-year-olds to be molested? Why is this stuff going on? And we're focusing so much on why rather than what he did already, right? And, the, and we limit his redemption, right? And what's possible, and, and I'll, I'll answer his question here in a moment. And I, I'm amazed that God, do you know, and I talked about this, I think, last week. Do you understand that God is, is in Uganda actually bringing reconciliation, redemption, healing, and bringing an end to trauma to kids that had to kill their parents at gunpoint? Kids that, that literally were recruited into an army, the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army. We have families and, and friends from our church that go down and minister there called this place called the Village of Hope. This woman heard a call of God in her life, gave everything up, and went down there. Her name's Cindy. She's amazing. She's got 200 kids in this, in this place where these kids, they're literally rescuing them off the streets. Kids that are walking around lifeless because of, of what they've done. And God doesn't want us living with the reminder of what we've done. Isn't that amazing? So to answer people's questions like that, it, there, there's so much freedom and, and, and grace in, in, the, in the Lord. And so, here, it even talks about in the shack, it says, we as people cried out for independence and we got it and now we have issues with the one that gave it to us. And that's, that's the bulk of it, is the reality. Yes, there is evil. Yes, we have the capacity to choose. And you know what the reality is? Mom and dad never would have done that if they understood who they were and how precious we are. That's just the truth. That's, my mom and dad never would have divorced at eight. My mom wouldn't have been found in the arms of another man if she understood how valuable she was. That's just the truth, guys. And we need to magnify. I, I, I said it last week, and I said it again this morning. I said, hey, guys, here's the deal. The law's job was to reveal sin. Right? So if we're walking around still making a big deal of sin and we're not under the law anymore, we should probably stop talking about it. What should be found on our mouth is not what people are doing wrong, but what God did right and letting that soak over people and wash over people. Let that transform them and change them. Right? Because, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I talked about that a little bit last week. Yeah, yeah, I, I talked about that last week. Well, see, because, and I said last week, I said, here's the deal, guys. If we didn't save ourselves, right, but it's by his mercy. Literally, he, he rested from his works before the foundation of the world. Can I be honest with you? All we're doing is just saying yes to it. All we're doing is stepping into it and saying, okay, right? Because this is the work of God that you would just believe. Jesus made that really clear in John 6 right? So this is what I said about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. See, it's, see, it's interesting. We, everybody knows that. Everybody knows that part. Everybody knows that verse, and they, they always forget the one that comes after. I'm not bashing you, honey, but that's, and earlier in Philippians 1, 6, it says what? That he's going to finish the work he began, right? We are constantly, to the degree that we're able to trust him, yielding to that, yielding to him fathering us, ye- knowing his heart. Because if I, if I have the knowledge of good and evil apart from love, if, apart from his heart, I don't want anything to do with him. But if I so understand his love for me, right? God, come father me and come potter me. Are you kidding me? I don't want anything else to. Pastor Don said, I don't know if I'll be able to say it as well as he did. He said, I don't want any thought in my mind. Do you remember how it goes, Don? That's not of you or something like that? That's amazing. I don't want any thought in my mind about me that isn't his thought about me. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's what I, I have to remember to repeat that because Shane was telling me we got some complaints last week because people were asking questions. So let me, this, young, this lady, just for the watchers and listeners online, this lady just asked, can you explain to me the verse that says working out your salvation with fear and trembling? It's God who said the work I began, I'm going to p- complete, right? Philippians 1, 6, now watch. To work out your salvation with fear and trembling, we think that's all about us biting our lip and trying and, and uh, you know what I mean, and, 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 and everything else. No, knowing that it's him who's at work in you is the next verse, both for his good will and his good pleasure. It's his desire, guys. It's his good pleasure to form Christ in us. Isn't that amazing? So when, we, when working out your salvation with fear and trembling, sweetie, the way that I understand it, so that it's not about works and striving and something that I'm doing, is I sit and literally meditate on the reality of what he did with reverence and trembling like, God, you really love me that much. You're amazing and I yield to that. Come have your way in me and I surrender and you finish the work you promised you were going to begin, that you were going to finish. Does that make sense, honey? So that's just, for me, that's just the way that I understand it. If I, go ahead, uh, Caleb, hang on, let me get the mic because if I don't, I'm going to get crucified and I don't want stones thrown at me. So does anybody have the mic? Don, do you have it? Okay, because I, I want to get your question on, on, uh, on the, the CD. This is mine, sweetie. I'm going to take that. Uh, 
I know we're in Exodus 15, but just hang on. And then we, we are going to take a look at some of the things that, that, that's written in the shack. It's, it's just amazing, guys. It's just amazing. Because the things that we've come to believe apart from God, apart from Jesus, are literally mindsets of hell right now. And they're not producing life that God wants to purge us of. Go ahead. Um, isn't the... You're on, buddy. Isn't the Ten Commandments the Old Covenant? And when mm-hmm. Jesus died on the cross and said it is finished... Mm-hmm. He meant it is finished. Yes. Yeah. And all we have to do is walk out love. Yeah. Well, even, even that, what, what's the fulfillment of the law? Is love, mm-hmm. right? It's what Jesus, he said, I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it, right? I came to show you what it looked like. The law, as weak as it was in the flesh, what man could not do, he did on our behalf. See, it's, not even, it's never been about what we've been able to do. It's always, always, you were predestined before the foundation of the world to be conformed to the image of his son. That's, that's Romans 8. Before the foundation of the world, you were to be found in him in Christ, holy and blameless. It's all about, guys, what he's done and us being able to enter his rest. But if we do not trust and we do not believe, we cannot enter his rest. And that was the issue he had with Israel. Not that he had issues. I can't think of another way to say it, Right? They constantly didn't want to trust him. And if we don't trust him and we're trying to finish it, and this is, this is how people try to finish it apart from his heart, apart from love, is they will work hard at proving why they're not worthy or work hard at proving why they are. That's how people try to finish it. And you cannot enter his rest if you're still working and you're still trying to accomplish what's already been done. No, he's asking you to just believe so you could be at rest in peace. We got, do you have a question here, buddy? Oh, okay, go ahead, Pastor Don, please. Well, Get just, on the mic. It just totally sparked something because what you just said is that he, he talked a little bit ago about the prodigal son, mm-hmm. right? The two sons that are standing on the porch, one said, I am worthy. Yes. I've always been right. Yep. And he's wrong. Yes. The other one said, I'm not worthy, <laughs> right? He's saying, I'm not worthy and I'll never be good enough. Mm-hmm. And he's wrong. Both That's the it. sons had a twisted view. Of who the father is. Uh, because they didn't understand the father. But yes. it was exactly what you just said. Yes. It, it, it comes down to that is that one felt like they were good enough and the other one felt like they could yes. never be good enough and they were both wrong. Yeah. And how amazing is that? So watch. Literally, heaven and hell is at the party at the same time, like I was saying earlier. Let me finish what I mean by that. So you have the younger brother. We talked about this last week, right? Both of them, how many of you understand both of them are fallen sons? They have a wrong view of who God is wrong view of who the father is right so what happened through the fall we became fallen sons fallen daughters we took on a wrong understanding of who god is right satan lied to us deceived us we took on his nature and his image and uh so we inherited the knowledge of good and evil apart from love so you have the younger brother with the conscious awareness of evil apart from god's heart apart from love and he marks himself as unworthy pastor don just said he's wrong we have the older brother with the conscious awareness of what's right apart from the, the heart of the Father, right? And he's wrong. He had the conscious awareness of what was good. And he said, have I not, I've been with you all this time. And, this, and truthfully, his view of the Father was, you didn't even give me a goat. He's calling his father, he's calling his father cheap. Goats don't even have any meat on him. But watch, watch this. I talked about this morning. Adam was doing testimonies up front and they were amazing and it was, it was, it was awesome. People were sharing testimonies about healings and stuff like that. There was a point in time where I couldn't even hear testimony and, not, and have it not stir up jealousy and insecurity within me. Do you know what I mean? Now watch. How can that mindset, if I can't enjoy somebody's blessing, what God's doing in their life, that's, that's just like the older brother. You can't come into the party. It's still a mindset of hell that God's trying to get out of us, right? Right? So when it talks about in Colossians 3, now you take it all off. He's trying to get you to disassociate from anger, wrath, bitterness, malice, abusive speech, right? I understand even more now than ever when he talks about if there's envy and jealousy, there's evil and wicked, and every evil and wicked thing, right? Because that's what was going on with the older brother. Literally, the mindset of hell couldn't even come into the party. Now watch how amazing God is. He comes out to hell and says, don't you want to still come in? Mm. How crazy is that? The father still comes out. And asks him. And he says, he, couldn't, he could not stand the fact what, how the father was treating the younger brother. And that's the issue people had with Jesus on the planet. What are you doing hanging out with these people? Don't you know who this woman is, God, that's anointing your feet with tears, Jesus? Don't you know where she's been? You know how amazing his comment is? That he was forgiven much, loves much? that it was a double anointing right there 
with not only the perfume but also her tears. Oh, that's awesome. Preparing him for burial so that, watch this, even when he was being beaten, even when he was being whipped, even when he was hanging on the cross, do you know what he smelled like? That woman's perfume. He smelled like our worship. I can feel that all over me. He's awesome, guys. He's really amazing. And he's trying to save us, guys, from how we see people, ourselves, and it's all rooted in how we see him. I feel like I could talk about this the entire identity school. Just because it's big in my heart. You hear Pastor Don say this is really big in my heart right now, and, and there are things and revelations that he shares. And do you guys hear the revelation about the what he calls the Great Samaritan last night? And and David and Goliath. Holy cow. I was in class last year when he talked about that. I was just done. I said, all right, whatever. That's amazing. I don't know what to say to that. I was floored. Somebody else, had, you had your hand up over here, sweetheart. Let's get the mic real quick so we can. My question is, how comes when. Hang on, I don't think it's on, honey. Make sure that underneath it's turned on. Um, my question is, how comes when some people. Um, get saved. Mm -hmm. They have a dramatic experience, and then right. some people have. Am I on? Have they just yeah. know? Yeah. How come? How come they know what? Well, no. How come some people have a dramatic experience and some people don't? Right. Is my question. Yeah. Do you, do you have do you have an example of that? Do you know? Yeah. If, if, can you can you go ahead and share that? Well, I I was saved when I was 17 years old. Right. And. Um, when I got saved, I, for I know a good two or three weeks, I walked off the ground three feet, right. three feet, and I had a smile from here to here. Yeah, and you know, people noticed right. that I was different, mm -hmm. and I felt different. Yeah, and I knew I was different. Right, but I just remember how I was feeling inside. Right, I just felt like I had so much love; it was so overwhelming. Yeah, and I smiled. And like yeah, I said it was off my face. Yeah, now watch this: as you received him, so walk in him. Colossians 2, right? So we received him how? By faith. You're saved by grace through faith, right? And the greatest issue, how, how many people know that, that people could come up to this beautiful young woman and say, don't you worry, sweetheart, you'll come down off that mountain soon. You'll be just like everybody else. Don't you worry, you'll, you'll see. That's just a mountain high right now. Tell that to Todd White. I don't think the man's ever come down after eight years, Right? <laughs> But now watch, I had the same kind of experience, honey. And some of it, like, I don't know if I can answer that question truthfully because it's not about comparing stories and apples to apples and all that stuff. Some of it, I think, truthfully, is, is the degree that we give in the moment. So when I came to an end on myself and I really had nowhere to go, right, and all the while my mom behind closed doors has been praying, wonder if Jesus is interceding at the right hand of his father right now. All the while my mom never once brought to my attention what I was doing wrong, but she just waited patiently, right? So when I came to her, and she put this video, and it was 1998. I don't think DVDs were popular at this time yet. She put this VHS in the VCR, and it was, I told you guys last week, it was this man who was bald and uh, had this mustache, and he was singing about how the blood of Jesus covered him. Nobody said, repeat after me. Nobody said, say this prayer. Nobody said a word. I don't know what happened. I just started crying, and in an instant, every drug addiction was taken away from me. That was a dramatic Born again experience where I tasted and saw the kindness of God that changed my mind about who I was and who he was, right? I was so on fire for weeks on end. I buried myself in the word. I immersed myself, right? And please hear my heart. I am not bashing. Like Adam said, I love, when Adam, Adam, Adam has such knowledge of church history and things like that, and Adam's always so quick to say, you understand your fight's not against your church and where you go and, and th your fight's not against pastors. But one of the things, I couldn't explain it. I had absolutely no church background whatsoever. Very little did I have. I was in church up to about seven years old and I don't really remember much. My dad would have told you that I was born again at five. I don't know what I understood then at five. I certainly understood what I know now when I was 19, I understood it then, what I was giving myself to, and I was letting go. If any man come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me, right? So that's exactly what I did. I came to an end of myself, denied myself, denied what I was holding on to, white-knuckled, called my rights, wrongs, reasons, why, justifications, permission slips, right? Let that all go. Well, it was the, it was the parents you gave me, God. It's how I turned out because of you, right? I let that all go. And in that moment, Something amazing happened where I became brand new. What was killing me was no longer killing me. And I was reading the word and I had absolutely no church background, no experience. And all of a sudden, God started to speak to my heart about being baptized. I had no idea. I didn't even know what it was. 
And I told my father, I said, Dad, I said, God's telling me I need to go get baptized. We started calling church after church after church. You know what the response was? No. You're not a member here. You need to take a class. You need to do this. You need to do that. So what started to happen slowly over time? Stuff started to just, I started to lose what I was walking in, that, that, the mountain high, right? Because I was lacking in understanding and, and wasn't able to, to, to pursue. And I, how many of you know I probably could have just walked out to the creek and just dunked myself in there and that would have been the end of it, yep. right? You don't really need anybody else to, I mean, yep. but I, I mean, I was, I was lacking understanding, lacking fathering and, and you know, I, I love it. Like I, I heard this, I was blown away by this. We make such a big deal out of, um, and, and I love it, like, People have come, can I be honest with you? I would love to have access to people like Pastor Don, people like Pastor Dan, and, and just follow them around, right? I've heard that Dan will actually tell people, I can't be your spiritual father. You have to, you, you and Holy Spirit have to do it together. You have to figure it out. You have to, because you can't, I can't live through Pastor Don's revelation. He, it's what he's getting in his prayer closet. It's what God, that's real to him, Right? So when he talks about Golgotha, when he talks about Goliath of Gath, when he talks about the Good Samaritan, he's alive when he's talking. Now, I can come alive through it and be like, that's awesome, and never see it the same again, but that's really meaningful and impactful to him, right? So we are building history with God, and so why are some people's experiences more grandiose than others? I think some of it is to the degree that they understand, is to the degree that they're experiencing it. I think some, um, it's what they're giving in the moment. Maybe they're not wholly invested into it. Go ahead, honey why I experienced it because I grew up feeling very unloved mm -hmm. very unlovable like I wasn't worthy for right. someone to love me yes and I think God wanted to show me what love was yeah and and I was able to receive it and that's why I think yeah. I experienced why that. it was so dramatic for you yeah. absolutely yeah no it's good are you guys okay with what she's asking and talking about yeah this guy this gentleman has a question um the same thing that she was saying do you think it has anything to do with how much you believe? Oh, I think it all has to do with what we believe. In a very, I mean, I, I think this whole thing is about what we believe. I think this whole thing is about faith. I think, I think Jesus made a very big deal about what we believe, right? And I think, I really do, I think to the degree that we understand and believe, you know, but we're not, because like, and, 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 and you guys know this, and, and it's, it's we, we, we make such a big deal out of, out of what we feel, but our beliefs are following what we believe. And I believe over time, the more that we've settled in our heart that God loves us, we will be able to be people like Pastor Dan that can just say the name of Jesus and instantly feel him, you know? Because, because of the history that Dan has built with God, he's, he's able to be trusted and steward those kinds of feelings. You've seen him, he's an emotional roller coaster. Holy moly, you know? And I'm thankful for people like him. I'm thankful for people like Pastor Don and, and these guys. That, that, that it's, it's not that I'm looking at him saying, there's Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at him saying, wow, that's possible. That's possible to walk in that kind of happiness all the time. It's possible to have that kind of joy all the time. It's possible to not allow your circumstances to dictate your day and be the evidence and barometer of God's love for you. That's why I loved it when Don said it yesterday. I pumped my fist in the air. I had my coffee. And I was like, oh, because he was talking about it yesterday morning. He said, in this is love, 1 John 4.10. If you want to know what love's definition is, in this is love. Not that you loved him, but that he first loved you and gave himself to be the propitiation or the substitute for your sins. That's the evidence of God's love towards you. That's the barometer of his love. In this God demonstrates his love, Romans 5, I believe it's verse 8, that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died. Anything less than that is going to be deception, guys. Does God bless? Absolutely. Can you walk in divine health? Absolutely. I've seen it. I, I know people that do it. But if I'm not, it doesn't mean God's, God's impartial to me. He doesn't like me, right? I talked about this morning. There was a, I was uh, in Tennessee back in April, and I was outside, and we were, um, we were down with uh, my wife's side of the family. I mean, there must have been umpteen kids running around. We were all in the same house. Trying to get alone with God was, it was a chore. But one day I finally got out, and I'm sitting on this deck, and, and the reality, I felt like God said, I want you to read Psalm 139. And I know Psalm 139, right? I mean, we, we, most of us do, talking about, uh, um, behold, uh, um, well, let's, I'm, I'm going to turn. I know I had you guys in, in Exodus, but I want to turn to uh, Psalm 139 quick. I'm sorry, guys. Because it's an amazing, amazing psalm, talking about how God, has, he knows you, he scrutinizes your path, all that stuff. Now watch this. Because you can read this, have the wrong understanding of God, and be like, oh my goodness. 
Oh, crap. If I can say that, I hope that's not. Sorry on the... But watch this. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. Some would be like, oh, boy. Yikes. Right? If you don't know his heart. Watch. You have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You know when I look at that? I read and I, I hear I'm such a big deal to him. Wow, he, he really, he, watch this. He not only knows me, but he really likes me and loves me. He really does, guys. You're not a surprise to him. My gosh, the way that we even judge one another is not the way that he sees. You know what I mean? Love covers a multitude of sin. Love hopes all things, believes all things, never fails, right? You understand my thought from afar. Wow. You, watch. You scrutinize my path in my li- lying down, not because he's trying to find fault with you. All he can see is, is what you were created to be in the beginning. Anyway. All he can see when he looks at you is his son. All he can see is this is my daughter. Wow, I'm so pleased with her. She's amazing. There are some people that really get this. There are some people that really understand, people like Nick Billman that understand that God is singing over him, that God really rejoices over him, that when God thinks about him, he's super pumped, you know? This is the stuff, guys, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, if it was good enough for Paul, it should be good enough for us. It really should be. If he said that this is the fullness of God in you, that you would know the love of Jesus. That's becoming the mature man. Hang on, Karis. That's becoming... Per, the perfect. Adam talked about that on about two Sundays ago. It was so good. He was talking about, you know, we sit there and we, we read that in 1 Corinthians 13. We think that has to do with the Bible. We think that has to do when Christ comes again. No, that has to do with what God's forming on the inside of you. Love. Love is the perfect. And you're to desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but when you're moving perfectly in love and, and perfect love is formed in you, you'll have no need for that stuff. Actually, that stuff flows out of love. It becomes more natural that way. But watch this. You scrutinize my path and my laying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Oh, intimately acquainted with all my ways. This is what he said to me. He said, Brian, he said, what could be more precious, what could be more beautiful right now than me both knowing you and loving you? And that, that, I, I just sat out and I, on the deck and I just cried. My whole life I wanted somebody to know me and understand me. My whole life I felt misunderstood. My whole life I felt rejected. My whole life taught me this is who you are. And all the while Satan's lying to me, fathering me, pottering, molding me in the image of the world, in his image. But now you're in it and not of it, according to Christ. We're learning, guys, to see. This is why it's so critical that we understand that it's all about the eye that you see through. It's all about the narrow path. It's all about the narrow way. It's all about the gate. It's all about the door. And it's all Jesus, guys. It's the image and the picture he painted about who God is and who you are. And anything less than that, I'm going to be black and It's just a flat out lie. Because like I said, either he's for you or he's not. Right? And then he goes on, he says, and nothing can separate you from the love of God. I love that. Neither, neither height nor depth, neither angel nor demon. Right? Nothing can separate you from the love of God. The only thing that can is your belief that you are. That you're cut off somehow. The only time you're ever not in right standing is when you think you're not. But you still are. That's the irony of the whole thing. It's so strange. But it's to the degree, so how important is belief? It's everything. It's what you're called to live by faith, not by what you see, not by what's going on, not by how life seems to be going, not by how you're feeling in the moment. We need to learn to kick the snot out of feelings that don't line up with truth by in that moment raising our hand and confessing what we know to be true, even though it may not seem that way in the moment. That's why I tell people it's so beautiful when it says in Hebrews 10, approach him, you can approach him now with boldness in the sincerity of your heart. You know what that means? God, I'm not playing any games. My heart really is to know you. I am sincere. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure motive, a good conscience, and a sincere faith sincerity, right? All God needs is your desire and he's got something to work with. That's all he needs. And every morning I wake up saying, yep, I say yes today. I say yes today. Even if it means, and I'm not, just hear my heart on, on this, like it, it's, even if it's 4.30 or 4 in the morning, there's something so amazing about getting up before the sun even comes out. Before my child, at, who's four years old, has a chance to 
shake me at six in the morning and say, Daddy, it's time to get up and give me chocolate milk. <laughs> Every morning, I'm like, oh, I know I'm to rejoice over this time now, but sometimes it's just hard. Four in the morning, Daddy, I want chocolate milk and want to watch cartoons. And sometimes I'm like, oh, Nicole, why don't you just get up? But I roll out. I let my wife sleep and I just get, because I know, I know I'll never get those moments back. I know I'll, I'll, one day I'll sit there and say, man, I remember when she used to do that. And I don't want to be somebody that's, that, that looks back with regret, that produces death. I don't want to do that. So even saying that, it's just, a, it's just a good affirmation. Some people had their hands up. You did, sweetie, but Karis, you did first. So is there something that you wanted to say? Hang on, honey. Let, let Pastor Don uh, give you the microphone quick. Okay. Going back to where uh, you said that Jesus loves us a lot. Yeah. Um, can he also love, like, everybody on the world? Oh, honey, it's such a good question. Yeah, absolutely. Sweetheart, he, it says, for God so loved the world that he died, right? John three sixteen. There's such innocence in your question, honey. I love it. He, um, it says that all men are now reconciled to God. All men are forgiven. Everybody. And I talked about that last week. Guys, listen, I said, Jesus' life was the courtship. His death was the proposal, and he's waiting for every man's yes. All men stand at the altar, not everybody's saying yes right now. He loves you enough to make that choice. It's so amazing to me. But every single person on the planet right now, whether they understand it or not, is completely, totally forgiven. Every person has received that credit card in the mail, but not everybody's calling the number to activate it. That's, that's the issue, guys, right? So we're, we're not walking around magnifying, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all has the appearance of self-made religion and self-abasement, what Colossians 2 talks about, but it's impossible to kill the indulgences of the flesh. What's, what kills the indulgences of the flesh? What causes me to yield my life to deny myself when I see who he is for who he is? And I see how he sees me and what I was created for, and I say yes to that. And his spirit comes alive. He breathes on me and puts his spirit back in me. And it, the Bible says in Romans 8, it says, if you're living by the Spirit, you're actually putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Mm, I love that stuff. You had your hand up, sweetie. Do you still have a question? That takes us back over to Romans 5, 5, where it says, and who maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, yeah. which is given unto us. It's yes. by the Spirit. He yes. sheds abroad. He's the, the love one pouring of God. out. Yeah, he's we the one know pouring him it on out. The cross. Yeah. And he sheds that in our heart, and it just, like, bursts. You know, yeah. it's just, I, I can't explain it, but um, it's it's a supernatural thing. Yeah. But um, in the Greek word, the deposit of the Holy Spirit is, is called a deposit, mm -hmm. but it's an engagement ring. Just think of that. God has given us the Holy Spirit, the engagement ring. Yeah. The church, can I, can the I give you a scripture for that? Yeah. It's, a, it's Ephesians 1. You're actually sealed with him yeah, as a sign of the so promise that's given to you. So oh, yeah. oh. Yeah, and yeah. What do we do? We prepare ourselves. That's it. That's where I was going to go with Exodus. All the while, he is preparing us. He's setting apart a people for himself, prepared for a wedding, guys. It's all wedding language. Even John 14 where he says, hey, guys, I'm going and preparing a place for you. Do you know what the Jewish groom would actually do? He'd build an addition onto his father's home. And then do you know what he'd do? He'd wait for the father to say, now's the time. Go get your bride. And that's why the son, that's why the, even the son doesn't know the hour and time that he's coming back for his bride. That, do you know what else the, 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 the woman would do? She would actually keep her lamp lit with enough oil in it, put it in her window so the bridegroom would know whose window it was. How many know that he's coming like a thief in the night? Ooh. That's exactly right, sweetheart. Come on. Yeah. No, he really loves us, guys. He really loves us. It actually talks about in Ephesians 5 that, that the union between a man and woman, I talk about this in my book, where, where it talks about that they become one flesh. And I, I, I was reading that, and then all of a sudden, the, I've, I've read that, and I I've, you know, know about that, but then it, after it says, and this mystery is great, I'm speaking in reference to Christ and the church, that you're now one with him. That right now, he's in you and you're in him. And I told you, I don't fully understand all this stuff, guys. I don't understand how I'm seated in two places at one time, but I think it's amazing. I don't understand how I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing, but I think it's awesome. And I think I'm growing in understanding of what that means and what it looks like. I think it's amazing. I've been given all things to live a life of godliness. That's incredible. All because of what he did, guys, because he, he can't imagine life without you. Wow. He's preparing a place. 
man, because you're such a big deal. He says, hey guys, fear not. That's what he's talking in, in John 14. Guys, don't be afraid. That's so awesome to me, guys. So even, even communion, it's all wedding language. Raising the cup. Even, even, even the Ten Commandments. When God, because that's what I'm saying, guys, he brought Egypt, he brought Israel out of Egypt to unlearn what they've learned to prepare them to meet with him. The marital, that, that, those Ten Commandments, it would be more understood in the Hebrew context and culture as being the ketubah, the marriage agreement. Literally, kind of like wedding vows. As if God was saying, this is what it means for you to enter into a relationship with me. Literally proposing to his people and they say, yes, they're being consecrated, they're being set apart. And they're saying yes. But here's the deal. Because they weren't willing to taste and see and trust that it was finished and, and, and that God was, that guys, their clothes didn't wear out. Bread was miraculously showing up every morning. Quail was being given to them. Water was coming out of rocks. And they're like, eh, nah, put us back. Put us back. Do you know what God revealed to me? This, is, this was the revelation. This is powerful. He said, when I was reading this and I was looking, because one of the places that they go through is the wilderness of sin in Exodus 16. And if we follow, if we follow the definition of, of sin, that's the disbelief that God is good. Because we know, let's face it, what did Satan bring in the question in the garden? Is God really this good? Did he really make you in his image? Is he not holding out on you? Wonder if he's just afraid that you're going to become like him, right? Insecurity, inferiority. Saul with her two eyes that it was good to make her wise. She took and she ate. We do it all the time. We're desperate to want to know. We're desperate to accumulate knowledge which puffs up its love that edifies, right? So here they're wandering around the wilderness of sin and they're putting God to the test continuously. And you put God to the test because of unbelief. That's what puts him to the test. See, it's funny. My father, my father has an interesting definition of that verse. My father works in uh, insurance and works with financial planning. And, uh, and I, I said to him one day, I said, Fa- Dad, I said, hey, I don't think, um, and, and, and please hear me, don't judge yourself accordingly. Based, judge yourself according to your faith. Okay, honor your conscience to the degree that you understand your freedom and to the degree that you know him right now. Okay, it's called the law of love in Romans 14. So I said, uh, I said to my dad, I said, Dad, I'm just not really sure about this whole life insurance policy thing. I really do believe that when God says he's going to take care of me, that that's exactly what's going to happen. And he says, Brian, we're not supposed to put the Lord our God to foolish tests. I, I'm thinking, no. I'm talking about faith. You're hearing something completely different, right? So hear my, hear my heart on that. We, we put the Lord God to the test, not because I'm denying something that's... The Bible says that anything that's not done in faith is sin. This is the New Testament definition for sin, right? Because there's a lot of things that people are doing. How many of you know that I could pursue not living with life insurance because I think that if I don't, God might be disappointed in me? Did you hear me right? Pastor Don got it. Like, at least Don got it. Some people are doing things out of fear more than they are out of faith because they're afraid that God's going to be angry with them if they don't. No, honor what you believe and let God grow what you believe. Right? Let him tend to the tree. Let him bring the fertilizer. Let him water. Let him prune. Let just you continue to abide in the love of God and watch Watch you bloom. Watch the kingdom of God is like a seed that when it's sown, it grows to be the largest tree, right? So let, let him just continue to work on you and sow seed and let people come in water and just you, you just, get, you just get alone with the Lord and let him take care of all that. So they're wandering around the wilderness of sin. God tells them, on the sixth day, gather twice as much of the manna that's, being, that's, that's on the ground because on the seventh day will be a holy day. It'll be a Sabbath day rest. Do you know that God did not create the Sabbath for himself? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, she's on it. We, he, he created it so that we would actually be still and know for a change that he's really God. That we would stop being robotic, stop working, and just take a chill pill for a little bit and see for him for who he really is, right? He did it for us, not for himself. Come on, he's not a God served by human hands as though he needed anything, Acts 17 says, because he is the one who's complete and gives life and breath to all things. He's the one that satisfies every need right? So let's just stop for a second and just really st- and, and think about that. So they're, they're wandering around. They're not gathering twice as much. They go out on the seventh day and they're still looking for what he said. Don't do that. These are the people that just saw the Red Sea part, just saw all these things happen, right? 
and they're still not trusting. Water's coming out of places, out of rocks. Paul says that rock was Christ. That's amazing that Christ was even present, that, that, that he was there. Just, oh, it's, 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 it's wild to me. The next place, this is the revelation that God gave to me. The next place that they come to is a place called Rephidim. And Rephidim, and this is the next stop before Sinai. Because I'm convinced, guys, that every trial and adversity in life is so you would find out what you b- really believe. And that's good news, right? You always hear Dan talk about if you squeeze an orange, you should get orange juice. If you, sque- if you squeeze it, you get apple juice. That's kind of strange. And how Satan has learned that when he squeezes Christians, everything but Christ comes out. And we should be just as freaked out that that's happening. I'm like, that is such a good word. That's such a good analogy. Every adversity, every, th- every time life squeezes is, a, is, is, is an opportunity for you to find out what you really believe. You know what James says? He then says, he talks about considering it all joy, James 1. Then he says, if any of you lacks wisdom. See, we make that all about um, if, if there's any area in your life that you're lacking, lacking wisdom, ask for it. And it probably does mean that. I'm cool with that. I ask for wisdom all the time. But if in the context of what he's talking about, I think he's saying this. If you're lacking wisdom in the moment, because how many of you know that when you go through a trial, suddenly you forget why you're in the trial? And your eyes are on the trial and you're freaking out wondering where God is. So if any of you lacks wisdom, ask for it so you know why you're in the trial to begin with. Because it's gold being purified by fire. It's good news. It's Christ being formed in you so you can see what you believe and go get alone with him and say, man, I don't like what's coming out of me. Gold, when it's melted down and it's, and it's heated up and it goes through the fire, impurities come to the surface. Right? Now hear my heart. You've been made clean. You've been made pure. But there are things that we still hold on to up here. That God's trying to get out, right? It's what we've learned through life apart from him. It's what Israel learned in the wilderness or in, in Egypt apart from him. And now they're having a hard time wondering if he's really that good. Where were you? Right? We do it all the time. We've even seen, you know, and some of it is, well, I'm not going to go there, but I was going to talk about how we just kind of came into the introduction of this thing called the faith, and that's been destructive to a lot of us. Because we made it about, do you want to go here or do you want to go there? Well, that's a no-brainer. What do you mean, do I want to go to the hell's fire? Come on. So some of that, sweetheart, has to do with the experience that we have with God when we get saved. Yes, you were way, way, way in the back. Don, and you're gonna have to, you're Don, Don's working off calories right now. I teach a Bible study, and mm-hmm. it's like six of us, and everybody's from different churches. And um, you gave me like a revelation already by holding on with the white knuckles. Yes. And they're holding on like the Lutherans are going, the Baptists are going, the, you know, whatever, the brother, and mm-hmm. I think it's brother in there too. <clears throat> and I said, I'm not here to talk about what church is going, because if we all love the Lord with our heart, soul, and mind, we're all getting to go. He ain't going to say, you know, separate us up there saying Luther's back. Because right. didn't denominations come from man? People? Oh, yeah, factions, yeah. opinions, people. You know, we're, we, we made it. See, this is what happens. Do you understand that m- the majority, if not all, of every denomination came out of a great revival? And as so many generations later, now all of a sudden we, we look at what was it that brought the revival and we make doctrines out of it and theologies out of it and opinions, right? The philosophies of man, right? So that's, and that's how, that's how this thing, but every, every revival began with a man looking at the word and saying, this doesn't line up with what I'm seeing with my two eyes. Every revival, men hungry after God right? People like John Wesley, the Methodists, I'll be honest with you, the Methodists love talking about, um, I think it's his, uh, his Aldersgate experience where he felt warm in his heart. And he refers to that as, as like the time when he believed, you know, that God loved him and he calls it kind of like his born again experience. There's another experience that he had where it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there's tons of Methodist churches called Aldersgate, but there's none that's referred to his experience when he got baptized in the Holy Spirit, Right? I went to a Methodist seminary. Man, I could get in trouble. This is all on tape. I went to a Methodist seminary. I went to Asbury Theological Seminary, right? They loved studying Wesleyan theology, but they never, ever, ever talked about the revivals that he did. They never, ever, ever talked about his baptism of the Holy Spirit. They threw all of that away, and they just talked about his essays, his, 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 uh, his messages, and the things that he preached and things like that. Right? I was in, in seminary. I never, ever once heard the name Smith Wigglesworth. 
I never once heard the name Catherine Coleman. I never ever once heard the name of these people like that Roberts Lairdon talks about in the God's Generals books, right? Some of it's because we're so freaked out by that stuff because it hasn't been our experience. Therefore, it can't happen. There's, there's actually a tone of arrogance there. If it didn't start with me, therefore, it can't be true, right? So you had your hand. Man, where are we going? I wanted to talk about Exodus. Where am I, what am I doing? All right, well, no, it's okay. We'll start, we'll start with you, buddy, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get around. I know we're not here to judge and by what you just said about the Wesleyan thing. Yeah. Um, I don't even know if I say that this is on tape. Right. Well, if, but, if you're not sure, then, buddy, I wouldn't. It, if you and I want to okay. talk about it's it after. Be, it's okay because it's truth. Right. Um, Don's um, putting his head down. He's like, here it goes. Me and my wife, me and my wife Bobby Joe, um, we come from a Nazarene church. Right. Actually, I'll talk to you about it after. Okay, that sounds I, like a good Yeah, because, yeah, we're not, guys, our fight's not against the church, right? It's not. It's not. But, the, and, and, and uh, honestly, there, there's, you know, I, I okay, how's, how's, this, how's this for just being really clear? I was, I was a, uh, a youth minister for four and a half years in an evangelical Lutheran church. And I could tell you, I didn't grow up Lutheran. I had no church experience whatsoever. It's just that's where God landed me, and I was okay with that. I could be at home on a Sunday morning and could tell you, based on where the clock was, what was going on in the service at that moment. Right here, they're, they're reciting the Apostles' Creed. This is when they're taking communion. This is when they're praying for the church. This is when the sermon's wrapping up. You know what I mean? Now, there were, there were people in that church where that was so meaningful and so impactful to them, right? And I truly believe that those people loved God to the best that they knew how to love him. And if those people, here's sobering thought, if those people knew what you knew about God, what if you found out that they would actually go further with what you know than what you're going with right now? It's so easy to go into a place and say, nah, dry bone, bleh, there's no life here, bleh. Right? Look at the songs they're singing. If it's not the organ, it's not Jesus. Right? What do you mean those drums are in here? That's the devil. You know? Oh, I mean, you, you, want, you want to hear something crazy? Do you know, <clears throat> do you want know churches split over more than anything else? Worship. Do you know what the first death was over in the Bible? Worship. Cain and Abel. Whose sacrifice was? Isn't that crazy? Satan is an ugly bugger. <laughs> Trying factions, divisions, right, opinions. Uh, 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 and it's not producing life anywhere, right? But to the degree that they know God, they're probably loving him with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And wonder if they knew what I knew, would they be further than where I am? It's a sobering thought, right? You had your hand up, sweetheart. Hang on. Right, hang on, hang on. We, yeah, let's just wait. I know, Don's like, yeah, this will be, yeah, let me, let me, let me get to Texas. This is going to be it right Yeah, now, this real is quick, it. Real quick. Um. I've learned that experiences, dreams, prophetic words, all those are not higher than the Word of God. So if we do not use the Word of God as the final authority in everything, mm -hmm. we will be deceived by Satan. Yeah, because you can be, because you're called thing, to test all things. Well, not anything that, but didn't Jesus use the Word on Satan when he was being tested and tempted and all that? But what I'm saying is, like, if I would have a dream, right. and I would come in here and give it to the church, or whatever, if, it, if that's what I thought that I should do, well, my dream is not the authority or whatever over of what God's word says, you know. Mm -hmm. We can get yeah. a lot of Well, we're hoping trouble. that that stuff lines up with already, what's already been explained well, no, through the uh, word. Yeah, I'm saying it, it, we have to be careful that we, like even other books and stuff that we read, you were saying about other yeah. things and revivals and stuff. We got to make sure that what we are reading lines up with the word of God right. is what I'm saying. And right. in all things. It always pertains back to the Word of God. Yeah. And we need to be in the Word of God. Yeah, we need to know the Word. Yeah, we need to, for sure. Well, that's the only thing that exposes the lies of the enemy is yeah. the Word. But here's, here's what's crazy about the Word. You can actually cause the Word to say something that it's not saying simply because of how you've been fathered your whole life. That's crazy to me, right? So I can, I can read where it talks about in John 15 that... Uh, that if you keep my commandments, that this is the one that loves me, right? I can read that and say, oh my gosh, I better be doing so. I better prove my love to God. No, what he's saying is this is the evidence of your love for me. Right. You'll follow it, right? So it's, it's just black and white. But we'll read that and say, man, I'm not doing enough. Man, I need to show Jesus that I really love him. 
But we just got done reading in Psalm 139. He's intimately well acquainted with you. I think he already knows. I don't think there's anything we can pull over him anyway, right? I think he's got a pretty good grasp on it. Grasp on it. So here's, here's the deal, guys. Pastor Don is able to do what I'm not, I cannot do. So he's shutting down questions right now because I would keep going. And, uh, and I'm glad that he, that he said, let's just, let's just wrap that up and, and get, into, get into the text, all right? So this is what I was saying. They, they just journeyed through the, the wilderness of sin. God is, God is exposing and dealing with their mindsets and all the while they're constantly being invited to trust him more but they're having a very difficult time. God's so merciful and gracious that, and, I mean, and, and it's, 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 it's pretty crazy, it's harsh. After a while, just the, an entire generation of just unbelief has to die off. Why? Because they couldn't inherit the promised land. Going back to what I was saying earlier, it's going to be hard to enter the party. If you're still moving or if you're still holding on to judgments about God that are wrong, about you that are wrong, Right? It's, it's just a very difficult thing. Rephidim, translated, means it's a desert place. It's a place without water. When I read that, I, it's, 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 it's nice. Like, I'm not, like I told you, I'm not a Greek and Hebrew scholar, but Adam and I have a Bible program called Bible Works, and we had gotten it through, through seminary. It's amazing. You can do intense Greek word studies and intense Hebrew word studies. I can, I can bring up my translation of the Bible, the New American Standard, put the cursor of the mouse over a word, and it'll tell me what it means in the Greek. It's really cool. It's, very, it's, it's awesome. And I, I think, if, Pastor Don, if we haven't offered that to you, uh, we, I'd love to give that to you. We have it on, on CD. But, um, so he could put it on his, his computer. But uh, here's the deal, guys. When I read that, when I read that about what Rephidim was and, and how it was a waterless place, do you know what God took me to immediately? He's so amazing. He took me to Matthew 12. Do you know what it talks about in Matthew 12? When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, where it wanders, waterless places looking for rest and then it comes back seven times worse than itself did Israel continue to grow wicked out there where did Israel want to go back to I'm not saying that they were full of demons what I'm saying was their mindset was corrupt it was deceived it was wicked they couldn't find rest because they couldn't trust God and they wanted to go back. It'd be better for us, God. What'd you do? Bring us out here to die. Where are you? Grumbling against Moses, finding complaints. I don't know if that, I mean, I don't know if that's, when I, when I heard that, I was like, oh my gosh. So what's he doing? He's trying to purge them of what they've come to believe apart from who God is. It's a purging that's taking place. Guys, it's, it's adversity that's revealing, right, and removing these obstacles that stand in our way. It's you now being transformed by the renewing of your mind, which only comes through you letting go of your story and accepting his and, and seeing truth for what it really is. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The truth is not some concept, it's a person. And it put on flesh to show us what it is. And, it's, and if you continue in my word, you'll know the truth, the truth will make you free. You'll be a disciple of mine, John 8, 31 through 32, Right? So all the while, and all the while, he's preparing a people to come and meet with him at Sinai, to come up, to sign to the agreement, to agree to these, this covenant that's being made through these commandments, through the sprinkling of blood. And they say this, they say, nope, you go up, Moses. We can't handle the peals of thunder and the lightning and the command that says, don't even let an animal touch this mountain or else it will die. How many of you know you're not being asked to come to Sinai, or, or Sinai, you're asked to come to Mount Zion now? That's in Hebrews, I think it's chapter 12 or maybe 13. Now watch this. It's the distrust of man in who God is, the disbelief that he's good. No, Moses, you go. God, we don't want you for a king. Give us an earthly king like the rest of the nations. God, we don't want to find out who you are. We'll come on Sunday mornings to Harvest Chapel, let Pastor Don spend time in his prayer closet, and then we'll find out what he has to say. We don't know you. I'm afraid to come to you. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment, torment. Right? I told you guys last time, back in, in, at the end of Hebrews, I think it's 9 verse 28, something like that, that Christ is coming back for salvation. It's coming again, but without reference to sin. 
Who wants to talk about sin? The ones that still think it's about sin. Who wants to talk about sin? The ones that still have issues with God. How could you love that person the way you do? See, when I, when I found out that some, truthfully, about a week or two ago, when I, find out, when I found out that some of the things that I was thinking up here, now how many of you know, guys, listen, it's, some of the stuff that goes on up in here, guys, has nothing to do with your thoughts whatsoever. Some of it's Satan just coming and, and, and just having a heyday, and we need to learn to take up the shield of faith. When you put on the armor of God, that's you putting on what Christ has accomplished. The armor of God is the finished work of Jesus. You're, you're in the strength of his might, not your own. The helmet of salvation, right? The breastplate of your righteousness, the belt of truth, right? The sandals that are prepared for the preparation of the taking of the gospel of peace, the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, which is able to extinguish every, 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 all of the fiery darts of the enemy. Every single one of them. What's the fight of faith? You being able to, in the face of life, still being able to believe the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, even though I can't see it, I have to know with all my heart, God spoke it, therefore it's real, therefore it's true. You have spoken in these last days, God, that you have loved me. You have spoken through your son. But can I be honest with you? So has everything else. Your life has spoken, the way you've been treated has spoken, the mistakes you've made have spoken but it's his blood that's crying out a better word on your behalf. Not justice, not, not judgment, not ugh, because mercy triumphs over judgment. So we're not holding people captive for the things that they've done and blaming them for how we've turned out. That's the mindset and voice of hell, and God is saying, get rid of that. Stop buying into that lie and eating out that lie because it's not producing life, it's actually killing you. Come and know me, have fellowship with me, taste and see that I'm good. He's waiting for us to let go of old mindsets, to sh- just get rid of that stuff, guys. But people, this is, this is, how much time do I have? Come on. I do. I have, I have, I have a half hour. That's exciting. So, now watch this. I think she's okay with this because I talked about with her about it this morning. You guys know Cynthia, right? She just interviewed me yesterday for the podcast that she does and everything else and I'm getting to know some really cool people through this school she's an amazing woman Um, (laughs) what's up buddy she's an amazing woman and I was looking at her computer screen a couple days ago I know she's okay with this because she said I could talk about this morning and I said wow I said your son's really handsome how old is he and she said well he's dead Talk about foot in the mouth. Ugh, I, I hate when that stuff happens. It's like, you know, and you didn't know, right? I mean, it's like when I, whenever I'd go up to somebody and say, hey, are you still with so-and-so? Nope, oh, sorry about that foot in the mouth, you know? <laughs> nope, they, they ditched me. Oh, I'm sorry, you know? Ugh. So she's like, no, he's, he's and, I, and I said, oh, I'm so, I, and like, I, I just, I'm like, I said, sweetheart, I'm so sorry. She goes, no, please don't be. I'm really okay with it. I said, really, tell me about that. Because remember, guys, we're talking, I'm, I'm talking about letting go of judgments that you've made about God apart from who Jesus is, okay? Things that people are holding on to with their knuckles that are killing them, white-knuckled, because that which you let go of, you find called your life, right? So it says, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, right? We're talking about, yes, absolutely what you became through the fall of man. Let go of that. That's not what you were originally created for. I know we'll unpack all that in school at some point in time, but you've got to let go of what you've come to believe apart from him. Deny what you see. Deny what you're holding on to. And come to accept and believe. And the more you can trust, the more you can taste, the more you can see. And how many of you know that the more you see is what you become, right? So now you, Second, Second Corinthians 3, now you with unveiled face, beholding as though in the mirror, the image and the glory of God, do you know that you are the glory of God? Psalm 8 talks about it. Hebrews 2 talks about it. All Hebrews 2 is doing is reciting and quoting Psalm 8. Where he talks about who, are, who is man that you're even thoughtful or mindful of him? right? This is David writing. David got a revelation of, of, of this stuff, and, and, uh, and it's amazing because if we could, it's not arrogant. Pastor Don said you should be able to look in the mirror and say, you're amazing. You're going to bless a lot of people today because you are. It's Christ in you. This is the mystery that was revealed, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's, that's so awesome that you're that, that you're that precious, that you're that special, that you're worth that much that he said, I can't wait to purchase that and put myself back in that place. But again, people have a hard time receiving that because how life has touched them. 
And that was me my whole life. If I can be honest and real with you, I read a book years ago called Approval Addiction by Joyce Meyer. See, I can say the name Joyce Meyer and you already cut me off and you can't hear what I have to say. Because people make these judgment calls in their heart and their mind about these people. Blah, 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 blah. Right? I'll be honest with you. I, I'm, I've read a book recently that, if, truthfully, if I told you the name and, and the, of the book and the person that wrote it, some of you might just be ready to pick up a stone. Because the book was so controversial when it was written. And I was like, man, if it's stirring up that much controversy, I bet it's good. <laughs> Seriously. It's got to be. Because people hate what gets exposed. Right? I'll tell you the name of the book, and I could, I, I could catch emails for this. Love Wins by Rob Bell. You know what people said? They, they think that Rob, Rob is saying that people aren't going to hell. That is not what he's saying. What I'm talking to you about right now is, is what God was talking to me about back in January, about the judgment and how I wonder if we're not going to get more of what we think about him than what he thinks about us on that day. I wonder if you have so much freedom in this thing that if it really was for freedom's sake that Christ came to get you free, that the mindset that you want to hold on to here, why wouldn't you be able to, allowed to hold on to it in eternity? Why is the gates to the New Jerusalem constantly open? Why did Satan have freedom to fall in heaven? Now, I, I believe this because ne nobody saw God at any time, but he who was in the bosom of the Father has explained him. I don't think now that when people are coming to the full realization, understanding who Jesus is, that they would even want to conceive of choosing anything else. But I don't think God prepared a place called hell because he couldn't wait to put people in fiery torment. And I also think in his love, he prepared it for the place that for people that really didn't want to choose him anyway. It always, for me, comes down to the choice. It always, every single person right now is reconciled to God. It's amazing to me. The things that God was talking to me about in January that you're hearing me talk, you know, think is, the, is exactly what Rob's talking about in that book. I, I do believe that Rob really, truly wants to know the heart of God. And Rob's a person that's just not afraid to ask the questions. But we've been taught we can't. That's heresy. Kill, like stone that guy, you know? That book caused so much controversy. I'm like, there's got to be truth in there. That's why people are having a hard time with it. I'm not saying you go out and read it. I'm saying the shack did the same thing for people. They couldn't handle that the father was manifesting as a woman in the book. There's feminine qualities to God, to God guys, throughout the Bible. Yeah. He made, he made them in his image and his likeness, Right? He said to Jerusalem, I've longed to gather you. Under, that's, that's nurturing. That's caring for like a mother, right? So yeah, people have a rare, I mean, like, and people, like, I could say that, and man, people will gnash their teeth about those books. It's like, come on, what are we so afraid of? Does love hope all things or doesn't it? Do we have more, more, more faith in our ability to be deceived or, or in God's ability to keep us and protect us? I'm just reading it because I want to formulate my own conclusions. I want to see what all the fuss is about, right? I had a woman come up to me in my church and say, I never thought I'd see that book in this place. And I was like, I'm sorry. Just kind of want to find out what it's saying. You know, just want to find for myself, you know. And the person said, I hope you're reading it with the eyes of wisdom. I'm like, man, will you stop being so scared? What are you so afraid of? You guys, if you don't know my heart by now, my gosh, lock me up. Put, throw me away if I mean maybe I am that deceived and crazy I don't know I know I was talking oh going back to Cynthia let me finish this her son dies two and a half years old it was the catalyst it was the event that event that actually she gave her life to Jesus in that moment see we would say it's where theologies come from see that had to have happened because look look what God did Look how she came to God. This is what I'm talking about. People actually are believing wrongly about him, that he's coming to kill, steal, and destroy, right? You can't show me, like I said, you can't show me that in Jesus' life where he did that. Not once. If that's true, why is he even asking us to raise the dead, right? Because it's all about legacy, destiny, and things that didn't get fulfilled, things, plans that he had, the workmanship prepared beforehand, before the foundation of the world where he rested from all of his works. She began to tell me, she said this to me. I, I, started, I, I got so choked up this morning when I was thinking about it. She said, Brian, do you know that my son will never have to experience rejection? Do you know that my son will never have to know going through high school and experiencing being picked on? Do you know, she said, that I'm thankful for the time that I had with my son? Oh, rather than the time that was taken and cut short. 
that's that she had that mindset and perspective and she didn't even sit underneath anything that Harvest Chapel was teaching. She didn't sit and uh, she wasn't hanging out with Happy Dan at that time. Right? <laughs> she was gaining that on her own. God was fathering her that way, but do you know what happened through the death of her son? Her parents got divorced because of it. Family started to, the family started to fall apart. They started to blame God for what had happened. And then we subpoena him in the core of our mind and say, it was you, it was you. where were you? It was your fault. Remember going back to, that this all started with God simply saying, Brian, what was fathering Israel for 400 years? What was fathering you for so long before you came to the Lord, right? Because even if you come into this thing because somebody told you one day to pray a prayer, there's things that we probably still hold on to if we don't understand the reality of what we're called to let go of. All those justifications, all those permission slips, all those reasons why that Jesus never had on the earth. But man, if he had any reason to be angry, hurt, broken, frustrated, emotionally abused, it would have been the Son of God. It just would have been. I have my, my, my best friend, you guys know him, Adam, who will be here tomorrow night. His father lost his arm in an automobile, or in, a, in, a, in an accident when he was on his motorcycle. He lost his, his uh, right arm. His oldest son died from a freak military accident. The, the somebody, his, his brother was uh, 21 when he died. He thought it was uh, somebody in the military. His brother was an airborne ranger, thought it would be a good idea to run through an exercise with a live grenade strapped to his chest. He ran through the exercise, it fell off, it didn't go off, it was a dud, it didn't detonate. And, and the officers, officers had two choices. One was to send in backhoes and plows and plow the ground over just in case one day it would detonate or to send a team in to sweep and try to find it. They sent a team in, his brother was on the team. The moment he came upon it, he took shrapnel up his neck and bled a terrible, horrible death. Adam's father can't hear and he can't taste. And every single day he sings in the shower because he lives. Every single day. If there's any reason for anybody to be angry with God, for have a reason to say, God, where are you? What did you do? How could you let this happen to be that man? Adam's mom, for a very long time through the death of her son, went, went, through, went through hell on earth, guys. I'm telling you, heaven is here and now. Hell is here and now. And then the mindset that we live in and walk in what we hold on to, that which is what's killing us, that which we let go of, we'll find. Over time, she had so much anger and unforgiveness and judgment in her heart for the officer that signed the paper to send his, her son in. Then if you followed the logic and the thought, it became, God, you did this and you have no idea, out of her own mouth, you have no idea what I'm going through and what it's like to lose a son. And you know what God did with that one, don't you? It wrecked her too. Her parents, <clears throat> Adam's parents are unbelievable. They're unbelievable people. In this story, The Shack, how many of you have ever read the book? It's a lot of hands. There's a man by the name of Mackenzie. I, I truly believe with all my heart, every single detail in that book actually happened. You can disagree with me. I'm okay with that. I believe God's amazing. See, I, I can sit here and pick this book up and start reading from it, and people can find fault and say, that's not the word of God. Come on, guys. He's speaking through other means as well. He is talking, and what I'm reading here does line up in my, with my understanding of what the Word is saying. So here, but here's the thing, man. People, I'm telling you, people could be watching this right now, and they've already tuned me out because it doesn't line up with what they believe. I'm telling you, our faith cannot be bricks. It better be springs on a trampoline or we're in trouble. If we came to find out that what, some of the things that we believe and we hold on to aren't really real, aren't what we thought they were, a lot of us would, would fall apart. The only thing I care about and the only thing I cling to more than anything else is God loves me and if that's not foundational, I may have, I have, I'm in danger of reading and seeing his actions through a completely different lens. I'll interpret it through how life taught me and taught, touched me and all that stuff. In this story, in this book, and I love this because God takes a situation. See, we all have, we all have our reasons and, 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 and things why we might have fault issues and anger with God, but when you know this story, it seems like any story you could even have actually pales in comparison to that when it's not comparing war stories right? But here's a guy who's on vacation with his family, with his children. I think he has six children in all, and his youngest daughter, Missy, gets kidnapped while on vacation. And not only is she kidnapped, she gets taken to the shack. And not only is she taken to the shack, she's then brutally tortured and murdered by the man that kidnapped her. And the father starts to blame himself for not being there, for being a bad dad. And he enters what's called the great sadness the book talks about. 
And he gets this letter in the mail one day when his family's gone and they're away and he's at his home by himself. And it's an invitation from an anonymous writer that tells him to come to the shack where his daughter was murdered. And he thinks he's actually going to be, I think if I, if I remember right, that it's actually going to be the man that he's going to, he doesn't understand and believe yet and come to know that it's God yet. But the most powerful thing in this entire book to me is this chapter where it's called Here Comes the Judge. And where he, he goes into this cave and it's, it's this beautiful woman. He said it's not that he was lusting after her in the way that we understand lust and, and conceived in, in the flesh and things like that. Her beauty was such that he couldn't turn, take his eye off of her, Right? And it was a woman and it was wisdom. It was the personification of God's wisdom. It was Sophia in this cave. And there's this huge chair that's in there, this huge wooden ornate chair. And she brings him in and he, she tells him, you're here for judgment. And he thinks that he's about to get judged for all the ways that he judged people and everything else. And she says, no, you're here to judge God and to judge the world. I'm going to read to you. Are you guys okay? I read to my daughter all the time. Are you guys okay with me reading this? Guys, there wasn't a dry eye in the room when I got done. I mean, God was wrecking us today because we're unlearning what we've come to believe that is not producing life and it is not good news. And if it's not, I'm not afraid to turn the apple cart over and look at it. And just because I was taught it my whole life doesn't mean that it's real and doesn't mean that it's true. I really want to know him, guys. I am not shortcut. I am not joking when I say that. I wouldn't be waking up at four in the morning if I'm not that I'm not waking up that early. And I'm not saying that to magnify myself, so please don't disqualify yourself if if you're not waking up at four AM. What I'm saying is I'm serious. I'm serious. Paul said, The thing that laid hold of me, Philippians three, I want to lay hold of. The thing that gripped my heart, I want to know and understand. I want to yearn for the pure milk of the word, first Peter two two, that I might grow in reference to salvation. I really want to know him, guys. This is eternal life. Not my permission slips, not why. Why'd they do this to me and how come that and where were you and all that stuff. That's still God, that's still Satan trying to get us to put God on the, on the seat to judge him, okay? So listen, this is five pages long. Are you guys okay? All right. How many of you have never read this book before? Awesome. She says to him, you will be the judge. The knot in his stomach returned as he realized what she had said. Finally, he dropped his eyes to the chair that stood waiting for him. What? Me? I'd rather not. He paused. I don't have any ability to judge. Oh, that is not true, returned the quick reply, tinged now with a hint of sarcasm. You have already proven yourself very capable, even in our short time together. And besides, you have judged many throughout your life. You have judged the actions and even the motivations of others as if you somehow knew what those were in truth. You have judged the color of skin and body language and body odor. You have judged history and relationships. You have even judged the value of a person's life by the quality of your concept of beauty. How many of you know people are doing that today? Women especially. Being scrutinized through what what we consider to be beauty in the eye of the beholder, beauty in the eyes of the world. And it's not fair, and it's a lie, girls. By all accounts, you are quite well practiced in the activity. Mac felt shame reddening in his face. He had to admit he has done an awful lot of judging in his time. But he was no different than anyone else, was he? Who doesn't jump to conclusions about others from the way they impact us? It was again his self-centered view of the world around him. He looked up and saw her peering intently at him and quickly looked down again. Tell me, she inquired, if I may ask, by what criteria do you base your judgments? Mac looked up and tried to meet her gaze, but found that when he looked directly at her, his thinking wavered. To peer into her eyes and keep a train of coherent and logical thoughts seemed to be impossible. He had to look away and into the darkness of the corner of the room, hoping to collect himself. Men weren't coming to light. Why? Because they were afraid their deeds were going to be exposed because they loved the darkness more than the light because they judged the light wrong. God wasn't judging. We were judging. God was revealing what we judged. Nothing that seems to make much sense at the moment, he finally admitted, his voice faltering. I confess that when I made those judgments, I felt quite justified. But now, of course you did, she said, like a matter of fact, like something routine, not paying for even a moment upon his evident shame and distress. Judging requires that you think yourself superior over the one you judge. 
What's Satan trying to do to get through you? What's, he knows he can't march back into heaven, right? So, what, so whose throne is he trying to sit on? In your mind. To raise himself up against the knowledge of God. Right? He's trying to fortify himself, fortresses in your thinking. And when these things are exposed and when people find out what they've been believing about God, now all of a sudden that's challenged. <laughs> Weeping and gnashing of teeth. What do you mean? I thought God killed my son. What do you mean he didn't do it? Because we try to find comfort in that. Well, it was just his time. Do you know what David Hogan told Cynthia when she was talking to him about the loss of her son? He said, the day you got married and the day your son died is the same. God didn't change. And I was like, yay. Wow. But you know, David Hogan walks that reality. The man buried how many of his friends? And I heard him talk one time in here. You know what he talked about? This is the day that the Lord has made. We will, yeah, and we will rejoice in it. He said, it's all the same whether height or depth, death or life. He said, it's all the same. And I was like, wow. Judging requires that you think yourself superior over the one you judge. Well, today you will be given the opportunity to put all your ability to use. Come on, she said, patting the back of the chair. I want you to sit here now. Hesitantly but obediently, he walked toward her and the waiting chair. With each step, he seemed to grow smaller, or they both grew larger. He couldn't tell which. He crawled up on the chair and felt childish with the massive desktop in front of him and his feet barely touching the floor. And, just what will I be judging, he asked, turning to look up at her. Not what, she paused and moved to the side of the desk. Who? His discomfort was growing in leaps and bounds, and sitting in an oversized regal chair didn't help. What right did he have to judge anyone? Sure, in some measure, he probably was guilty of judging almost everyone he had met and many that he had not. Mac knew he was thoroughly guilty for being self-centered. How dare he judge anyone else? All his judgments had been superficial, based on appearance and actions, things easily interpreted by whatever state of mind or prejudice that supported the need to exalt himself or to feel safe or to belong. He also knew that he was starting to panic. Your imagination, she interrupted his train of thought, is not serving you well at this moment. No kidding, Sherlock, is what he thought but all that came out of his mouth was a weak, I really can't do this. Whether you can or cannot is yet to be determined, she said with a smile, and my name is not Sherlock. <laughs> Mac was grateful for the darkened room that hid his embarrassment, covering up. The silence that followed seemed to hold him captive for much longer than the few seconds it actually took to find his voice and finally ask the question, so who is it that I'm supposed to judge? God, she paused, and the human race. She said it as if it was of no particular consequence. It simply rolled off her tongue as if this were a daily occurrence. Mac was dumbfounded. You've got to be kidding, he exclaimed. Why not? Surely there are many people in your world you think deserve judgment. There must be at least a few who are to blame for so much of the pain and suffering. What about the greedy who feed off the poor of the world? What about the ones who sacrifice their young children to war? What about the men who beat their wives, Mackenzie? What about the fathers who beat their sons for no reason but to assuage their own suffering? Don't they deserve judgment, Mackenzie? Mac could sense the depths of his unresolved anger rising like a flood of fury. He sank back into the chair, trying to maintain his balance against an onslaught of images, but he could feel his control ebbing away. His stomach nodded as he clenched his fists, his breathing coming short and quick. And what about the man who preys on innocent little girls? What about him? Is that man guilty? Should he be judged? Yes, screamed Mac, damn him to hell. Is he to blame for your loss? Yes. What about his father, the man who twisted his son into a terror? What about him? Yes, him too. How far do we go back, Mackenzie? This legacy of brokenness goes all the way back to Adam. What about him? But why stop there? What about God? God started this whole thing. Is God to blame? Mac was reeling. He didn't feel like a judge at all, but rather the one on trial. The woman was unrelenting. Isn't this where you are stuck, Mackenzie? Isn't this what fuels the great sadness? That God cannot be trusted? Surely a father like you can judge the father. Again, his anger rose like a towering flame. He wanted to lash out, but she was right. 
and there was no point in denying it. She continued, isn't that your just complaint, Mackenzie? That God has failed you, that he failed Missy? That before the creation, God knew that one day your Missy would be brutalized and he still created? And then he allowed that twisted soul to snatch her from your loving arms when he had the power to stop him? Isn't God to blame, Mackenzie? You can't tell me people don't think this stuff or everybody in this room hasn't thought it at one time. Mac was looking at the floor, a flurry of images pulling his emotions in every direction. Finally, he said it louder than he intended and pointed his finger right at her. Yes, God is to blame. The accusation hung in the room as the gavel fell in his heart. Then she said with finality, if you are able to judge God so easily, then you certainly can judge the world. Again, she spoke without emotion. You must choose two of your three children to spend eternity in God's new heavens and new earth, but only two. What? He erupted, turning to her in disbelief. And you must choose three of your children to spend eternity in hell. Mac couldn't believe what he was hearing and started to panic. Mackenzie, her voice now calm and wondering, wonderful as first he heard it. I'm only asking you to do something that you believe God does. He knows every person ever conceived and he knows them so much deeper and clearer than you will ever know your own children. He loves each one according to his knowledge of the being of that son or daughter. You believe he will condemn most to an eternity of torment away from his presence and apart from his love. Is this not true? I suppose I do. I've just never thought about it like this. He was stumbling over his words in his shock. I just assumed that somehow God could do that. Talking about hell was always sort of an abstract conversation, not about anyone that I truly... Mac hesitated, realizing that what he was about to say would sound ugly. Not about anyone that I truly cared about. So you suppose then that God does this easily, but you cannot. Come now, Mackenzie. Which three of your five children will you sentence to hell? Katie is struggling with you the most right now. She treats you badly and has said hurtful things to you. Perhaps she is the first and most logical choice. What about her? You are the judge, Mackenzie, and you must choose. I don't want to be the judge, he said, standing up. Mac's mind was racing. This couldn't be real. How could God ask him to choose among his own children? There was no way he could sentence Katie or any of his other children to an eternity in hell just because she had sinned against him. Even if Katie or Josh or John or Tyler committed some heinous crime, he still wouldn't do it. He couldn't for him. It wasn't about their performance. It was about his love for them. I can't do this, he said softly. You must, she replied. I can't do this, he said louder and more vehemently. You must, she said again, her voice softer. I will not do this, Mac yelled, his blood boiling hot inside him. You must, she whispered. I can't, I can't, I won't, he screamed. And now the words and emotions came tumbling out. The woman just stood watching and waiting. Finally, he looked at her, pleading with his eyes. Could I go instead? If you need someone to torture for eternity, I'll go in their place. Would that work? Could I do that? He felt her feet crying and begging. Now, please let me go for my children. Please, I'd be happy to. Please, I am begging you. Please, please, Mackenzie. Mackenzie, she whispered, and her words came like a splash of cool water on a brutally hot day. Her hands gently touched his cheeks as she lifted him to his feet, looking at her through blurring eyes, blurring tears. He could see that her smile was radiant. Now you sound like Jesus. You have judged well, Mackenzie, and I'm so proud of you. But I haven't judged anything, Mac offered in confusion. Oh, but you have. You have judged them worthy of love, even if it costs you everything. That is how Jesus loves. When he heard the words, he thought of his new friend waiting by the lake. And now you know Papa's heart, she added, who loves all his children perfectly. Immediately, Mrs. I- Missy's image flashed in his mind and he found himself bristling. Without thinking, he lifted himself back onto the chair. What just happened, Mackenzie, she asked. He saw no use trying to hide it. I understand Jesus' love, but God is another story. I don't find them to be like at all. You haven't enjoyed your time with Papa, she asked, surprised. No, I love Papa, whoever she is. She's amazing, but she's not anything like the God I've known. Maybe your understanding of God is wrong. Maybe, I just don't see how God loved Missy perfectly. So the judgment continues, she said with a sadness in her voice. That made Mac pause, but only for a moment. What am I supposed to think? I just don't understand how God could love Missy and let her go through that horror. She was innocent. She didn't do anything to deserve that. I know. Mac continued on. Did God use her to punish me for what I did to my father? That isn't fair. She didn't deserve this. Nan didn't deserve this. That's his wife. Tears streamed down his face. I might have, but they didn't. Is that who your God is, Mackenzie? It is no wonder you are drowning in your sorrow. Papa isn't like that, Mackenzie. She's not punishing you or Missy or Nan. This was not his doing, but he didn't stop it. No, he didn't. He doesn't stop a lot of things that cause him pain. Your world is severely broken. 
You demanded your independence and now you're angry with the one who, you lo- who loved you enough to give it to you. Nothing is as it should be, as Papa desires it to be, and as it, as it will be one day. Right now, your world is lost in darkness and chaos, and horrible things happen to those that he is especially fond of. Then why doesn't he do something about it? He already has. You mean what Jesus did? Haven't you seen the wounds on Papa too? I didn't understand them. How could he? For love. He chose the way of the cross, where mercy triumphs over justice because of love. Would you instead prefer he chose injustice for everyone? Do you want justice, dear judge? And she smiled as she said it. No, I don't, he said as he lowered his head. Not for me and not for my children. She waited, but I still don't understand why Missy had to die. She didn't have to, Mackenzie. This was no plan of Papa's. Papa has never needed evil to accomplish his good purposes. It is you humans who have embraced evil, and Papa has responded with goodness. What happened to Missy was the work of evil, and no one in your world is immune from it. But it hurts so much, there must be a better way. There is. You just can't see it now. Return from your independence, Mackenzie. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. Give up being his judge and no papa for who he is. Then you will be able to embrace his love in the midst of your pain instead of pushing him away with your self-centered perception of how you think the universe should be. Papa has crawled inside of your world to be with you, to be with Missy. Max stood up from the chair. I don't want to be a judge anymore. I really do want to trust Papa. Unnoticed by Mac, the room lightened. It got brighter. Yet again, as he moved around the table toward the simple chair where it all began, but I'll need help. She reached out and hugged Mac. Now that sounds like the start of the trip trip home, Mackenzie. It certainly does. Eight fifty seven. I'm just gonna let the silence do its thing for a second while people just sit on that for a minute. Father, our heart's desire is to really know you the right way. And I thank you, Lord, that you are just interested, God, more than anything else of causing these fortresses that have been erected in our thinking that we've allowed Satan to lie to us about, to establish and fortify himself in here, in the soul of man, to convince us of something that you're not I thank you that you really, I thank you for the way that you love us and I thank you that you really want us to know you. I thank you that this whole thing is about knowing you and tasting and seeing that you're good and letting go, Father, of what we've accumulated along the way and your grace is amazing and your grace is empowering us to do that. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Truth exposed what we were believing. Grace grace is saying, would you like to change it? I'll help you do it. I'll empower you to do it. I thank you, God, for the way that you love us. I thank you, God, for the way that you father us. I thank you that you are tearing down these fortresses in our thinking and that the weapons of our warfare are divinely powerful and the weapons of our warfare is and always will be the truth of who you are that's contained in your word. Father, we don't want to make you in our image anymore. Father, we let go right now of everything that life taught us about who you are. Father, we repent for the judgments that we've made about you, that we've made about ourselves, and what we've made about other people. Lord, I believe everybody in this room right now wants to see with your eyes. God, I believe everybody in this room wants to be able to receive your love in a greater capacity. I think Pastor Don was dead on yesterday with the prayer that he prayed and the things that he was sensing in his heart. And I thank you, God, that the more we see and the more we trust, you're enlarging our capacity to receive all that you are. 
And he who began a good work, guys, is going to complete it. And right now, Father, right now, to the best that we know how, we're yielding to you and we're saying, come and have your way. You father us, you lead us and guide us into all the truth because you promised that's what the Holy Spirit was going to do. Father, I have no interest in being deceived. Father, I have no interest in holding on to theologies and doctrines because that's the way it's always been. If it's apart from you, I'm asking right now, God, that you shape and mold every person in this room in the truth, Father, of who you are and who you say we are. I have no interest, God, in believing in something that is not producing life. I have no interest in believing something that's not good news, Father. And I thank you, God, that right now, Lord, you are, you are etching, you are shaping, you are molding. God, we are not stubborn clay. We are saying that you, God, I can feel this all over me. I feel like there's like a lightness in the room. I don't know what it is right now, but God, I thank you that you are chipping and chopping away, God, the things that have held us down, God, our rights, our reasons, the prison doors have flung open. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord God is on me for this reason, to proclaim release to captives, God, to set prisoners free, to proclaim the favorable year of our God, to grant a beauty, Father, instead of ashes, a garland, God, that you're restoring the former devastations. Mm. I have no interest in believing and fellowshipping with lies whatsoever, God, none. Thank you for fathering me. Thank you for your discipline. I welcome your discipline. I am not resisting you in any way, God. And if I am, Father, guys, we need to pray this in our heart. We're not going introspective, but I believe David was on to something when he prayed in Psalm 139, 23 through 24. God, search me and know me. See if there be any hurtful way in me. What's he saying? God, if there's something that I'm believing that's not true and is not the case, I don't want it there. Search me and know me. See if there be any hurtful way in me, then lead me in the everlasting way. God, I want to know your way. I have no interest in following the way that seems right to a man. I must know you, God. I must know you. I must know the love of Jesus. I must take it on. I must become this thing. Because you're trying to paint the right picture now even through us. Jesus said, the way that the Father sent me, I'm now sending you. Now you go. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Now you go. Father, set the record straight in us so that we might set the record straight through us and paint the right picture of who you are. That we might walk up to the world and say, did you know that Jesus was in the world? Did you know that it pleased the Father for all the fullness of the deity to dwell in bodily form? Did you know that God was in the world in his son, not counting men's sins against them? If he did it here on the earth and it was through Jesus, why is he going to be bringing it up later one day? If he told the woman caught in adultery, I don't condemn you either, why is he later one day going to bring her back out and say, now I do, everybody pick up a stone? He's not doing that. You only ever did what you saw your father doing and only ever said what you heard your father speak. I believe your words have eternal life, even if we don't understand them. Guys, eat my flesh, drink my blood. What are you talking about? We can't handle this. The 12 remain. Aren't you guys going to go too? Man, we don't understand what you're talking about. We know that there's, eternal, there's eternity in what you're saying. Your words are eternal life. We don't fully understand it, but we're not going anywhere. Father, I thank you that you're bringing understanding. I am not going anywhere. There are things I do read in your word that I don't understand, but you're causing the light to get brighter every day. I have no interest in judging you and holding you captive for things that I think you did when you sent your son. The only thing you ever allowed was your son to be crucified. And I want to stay there and I want to camp there and I want to know nothing but Jesus and him crucified. And Father, I'm not making light of people's losses. God, I'm not. But Satan has come alongside of people and he has whispered things that need torn down and need destroyed. God is not killing people, guys. God is not taking life to prove a point. God is not putting diseases on you to teach you some kind of lesson. He is the image of the invisible God. Father, we are knowing you and right now I just lift my hands and I say, Father, right now you just have your way. As an expression of just yielding, God, I lift my hands and say, I thank you that your love is real. I thank you that you're the truth about my life and the truth about who the Father is. I thank you, Jesus, that you came at the fullness of the time. I thank you that you thought it was a good idea, God, to put your spirit inside of me, that he might lead me and guide me, that he might bring to remembrance all things that you have spoken, that he might father me even now on this earth and cause me even through adversity, God, to grow in the image and likeness of your son. I thank you that I was predestined for this purpose and I am not fighting it and you will finish what you began. Father, you're amazing and I thank you for everybody in this class and I thank you that you're breaking strongholds down, you're tearing down fortresses, and I thank you, God. I thank you for your word. You have spoken in these last days. This is who I am. I have spoken through my son, 
And I am he that loves you. I am that I am that I am. I am he that loves you. I am he that's not changing his mind about you. I am he that forgives. I am he that loves radically with a furious longing. I am he that accepts you when you can't even accept yourself. Guys, I'm telling you, when we gave up on ourselves, he didn't give up. He's relentless, guys. You will not relent, God, till you have it all. You will not. So, Father, I'm asking you, guys, right now, I'm just putting my hands on my head. If you want to do that, great. Holy Spirit, thank you for transforming me by the renewing of this thing, God, and called my mind. Father, and I thank you that you're removing every fortress and every stronghold, and you're causing us to grow in the revelation of truth. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us. You're amazing in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you guys good? Holy cow. There's a lot more I could say, guys. I really could. I want to be sensitive to time, the camera guy, and everything else. Um, I can hang around for questions for a little bit, then I'm going to take off. I want to get back and see my wife, if that's okay with everybody. I love you guys. Guys, I'm pumped. Guys, listen. Thank you for having grace for me that I'm willing to ask questions. Guys, I want to grow in this thing and know. And I'm not afraid to be corrected. Like, if I'm deceived, like, okay, just, you know, I, I believe God, God handles that stuff. I do. We have, to, we have to be less interested with our needs to be right and loving to speak the truth rather than speaking the truth in love. Right? So let's do that, guys. Let's be careful how we wield our sword.